So this, you pretty much have to hold it like right on your chin because okay. as soon as you like, it, you know. Everybody hear me in the back? Yes, maybe. It may be a good thing if you can't. Okay, as Caitlin said, my name's Chris Verrett. Uh, I farm in uh, Crosby County between Rawls and Cone. And talking about no-till and cover crops and our experience with that and how we got started doing it. Uh, you just heard all that. Mainly cotton is our primary cash crop. We do a little bit of corn and some grain, something like that when, you know, when it fails or we got to come back with something else and a little bit of cow grazing when cover crop and rainfall allows. So where it started, um, this picture I took, um, I was flying back from Dallas uh, in uh, March of last year of 22 of w is when it was. And if you can look out the window, this picture was taken between Rawls and Lorenzo and that's looking back to the south. So Post and Robertson are out there that off the horizon somewhere, if you kind of know where that's at. Um, and you can kind of see from the picture, maybe you can or maybe you can't, or if anybody remembers how dry it was last year. Um, the bar ditches are filled in with silt in this picture. Um, if y'all remember who lived and farmed through this last year, which should be everybody in here, about how dry it was, you know, that time of year. Um, we received no rainfall, you know, since about August, I mean, October, September. And this year looked, was eerily similar to me um, as 2011 was. Um, I started farming in 2009, and anybody who lived and farmed through that knows, you know, how dry that year was. Um, and there was a lot of similarities in my mind that got me to thinking of when we got started doing this. Um, we had a decent insurance price, you know, dollar twenty-three and eleven, dollar three last year was pretty good. Um, but there was still a lot of things out of our control. Also, is what got started on this, just like it was last year. Um, we're extremely dry. We can't control the weather. We know that as producers, uh, we can't control the input costs. Um, we can't control what John Deere or Case is charging for equipment, can we? Um, can't control the weather. Um, for sure can't control any of that. Um, and so what, what, what is in our control? And that got me to thinking um, in 2011. And about the only thing that we can control is, you know, or one of the main things is how many passes are we making across this stuff? What are we doing with the resources that the good Lord gives us? You know, it's about the only thing that I can kind of control and kind of change and try to be in a better position to take advantage of some of those. You know, our most precious resource out here is water, um, or, you know, even more so than that is the rain that we get. And trying to be a better steward of that is how we got led down this and try to how we could be more resourceful. Because 2011 taught me one thing or one big thing is that um, I'm basically in control of nothing out here. Um, that we're, we're stewards of this land of God's creation and that we're in charge of relatively little to produce a good crop. Because I've never seen my best crop or my worst crop coming, as a wise man told me. And that's true when you think about it. Because so much of it is out of our control um, when we realize it or when we look back on it. And so how we got started or some of the things we've seen since we've been here is less soil erosion. You know, we know that. We don't get a, we get some soil erosion from moisture our big soil erosion comes from, our big part of it is, is wind loss, you know, or wind erosion. Um, this snow sure was nice driving up here. You're not having to look at a bunch of bare, blank, dry ground. But who remembers a couple of weeks ago when it was blowing 50 to 60 miles an hour, you know, and the sky turned brown and all of Brownfield and La Mesa was in our backyard. Um, and so this is a picture here you can see. Um, it's my pivot on the left where I got some CRP corners and a neighbor of mine to the right. <coughs> Excuse me. But that's some knee-high CRP grass is what that is. And this was last year in 22. And you can see just how dry it was. It buried that knee-high CRP grass. And so 
it's hard to drive by this and feel good, you know. And I've had some fields like this, too, where we didn't have cover come up, and you have some of this blowing um, and this soil and uh, trying to take off on you. And it's not good as a producer to drive by your field and not be able to stop it from blowing. Am I right? When it's so dry, maybe the cover didn't work out or, you know, it's just, just a situation we're in. And so trying to come up with something to be more resilient where we're not in that position. What we've seen since we started, less fuel that we're using on this. Maintenance on our, uh, maintenance equipment, uh, on working on equipment and wear and tear. Um, we've seen a 60% reduction in our fuel uh, diesel bill um, on our equipment since we started doing all of this. And this is 10 years ago when we started doing this when red diesel was a lot cheaper than it is today, you know. Dollar fifty red diesel as compared to three fifty or four dollar red diesel, um, you know sixty percent less sounds a whole lot better. I also priced a tire the other day. Um, who's priced a, a Firestone tire? Is for the for the front tire on a mechanical front wheel drive tractor. I was thinking fifteen sixteen hundred dollars would get it bought. That was way off. Uh, it was like thirty three hundred dollars is what it was for the front tire on a tractor. And so the less that we can we can drive these things, the better off. Because once again, that's a a factor I can't control. Uh, less employee burnout is one thing, big thing we've seen or that I didn't realize was a thing until we started doing it. You know, 20, 30 years ago, when everybody's running a sand fighter and you got guys, we all know, anybody in here who's tried to hire people knows how hard it is to find qualified people to do things, you know, to run equipment. And 20, 30 years ago, when it's Friday or Saturday because a sand fighter never needs to be run on Tuesday and Wednesday. It needs to be run on Friday, Saturday, Sunday is when it's going to be dry enough, right? And so when Friday, Saturday, Sunday comes, and used to be everybody was getting on a sand fighter. And so your guys that you're trying to keep around, employees, can look around and say, well, we're all in the same boat here. But that's not really the case anymore. Um, our labor pool of qualified applicants has gotten a lot less than what it used to be. And now guys can look across the road and say, well, these guys are going home on Friday and Saturday. Um, and we're, this is our third weekend in a row on a sand fighter, you know. And maybe they start looking around and thinking about different options. And so my point is, you know, employee retention, I, I don't miss banging out bearings on a sand fighter. You know, we still get plenty of that on other equipment. But welding on and beating on a sand fighter, I don't miss any of that. Uh, water infiltration. This is a field that we've seen, or this is a picture that I took. It was a couple of Septembers ago of my neighbor and mine. And I'm not saying we didn't have any runoff, but not near to the extent that my neighbor did. You can see where the water washed out and filled the bar ditch up. We got five inches of rain is what this was. And that's really some of the, the big benefits we've seemed to have in cover and not plowing this ground as much is better water infiltration. Um, you know, when we get half an inch or we get a good snow like this, that stuff's going to go on the ground. You know, I don't care what kind of ground you have. Even pretty sloping ground, it's going to do a good job. It's cool. Um, this stuff isn't evaporating off. But the rains in the fall and the spring, when we've got a small crop out there when we're trying to harvest, and when it's warm outside, and that's when we get four or five, maybe six inches at a time. And then the question is, what are we doing with it? We're, ideally, we want to try to capture as much as what we can, right? And hang on to it. Because once again, as we're going to see, you know, with all these costs going up, natural gas cost is what doubled since it has last year. You know, so pumping our way out of this isn't, isn't as appealing even as it was like. Farm Station, all ag, all day. I'm Stephen Orr. Today we're in Muncie, Texas for the 24th annual Caprock Crop Production Conference. Joining now in progress, Chris Barrett, who is talking about integrating cover crops. More important. Um, soil health benefits. We've seen a bunch of earthworms show back up, which it's nice having those guys out there do the work for me. Pulling trash in under the ground, making holes for the water to go into. You know, growing up when we were running a rod and a disc better, we never... I thought earthworms is something other people had. I didn't know they were in West Texas. Um, but now, I'm not kidding you, when we go to dig behind the planter, um, we dig up as many earthworms as, as we do cottonseed, you know, in a foot of trench, I would say, behind the planter. So, um, what a rotational sequence looks like. Pretty much most all, we've got a little bit of 
cotton on cotton on some drip, but probably 95% of our stuff is rotated, and this is how we go about doing it. So as soon as the cotton strippers leave in the field, we're planting some sort of cereal. Right now it's, it's rye. I wish I had a bunch of wheat planted is what I had wished I had planted this year with the price of wheat and now the snow. Um, she would be more appealing than having a bunch of rye. But anyway, we plant some sort of cereal behind the cotton stripper and try to get that in the ground as quickly as possible, you know, from the standpoint of um, trying to get it in before it gets too cool. You guys know all of that. Cotton farmers don't make great wheat farmers, um, you know, or at least a good harvest in a wheat farm, uh, wheat crop every year. But just because we plant so late, it tends to be our driest part of the year and our coolest part of the year as soon as we get through harvesting cotton. So we plant our rye behind the cotton stripper, and depending on, you know, hopefully we get enough rain, we can go in there and we can harvest that rye crop, hopefully for seed or to sell some of it, or if it's wheat, you can take it to the elevator. Um, we're irrigating very little of it, maybe just what we need for seed production. And then depending on how much cover you have, hopefully, you know, last year was really the first year in 10 years of doing it, that we didn't have enough rainfall to get a rye crop established everywhere just because it was so dry from the months of August, you know, to, I guess, May, when we got a little bit of rain at planting time. Um, but other than that, we usually used to have enough to keep the ground covered. But if you don't, that's when you can go in there and supplement with a summer cover. We've started to supplement with radishes in August is what we've started doing. Um, radishes make a fantastic rotation for most crops, but especially cotton. Uh, radish, and I planted 10 pounds of rye with this radish crop simply because it's very difficult to, there's two pounds of radish an acre, is what's planted in that picture right there, and that's a lot of radish. Um, it's very hard to screw a drill down to two pounds to the acre and be very accurate. And so we run 10 pounds of rye with it, and that's simply because that's all the rye that I had or that I could spare. Um, you know, you try to run something with carrier with it so we could plant 12 pounds to the acre instead of two. I also wanted to show this picture on here as an example, too, of, you know, especially if we're trying to grow a cover, and especially in an arid environment, as dry as it was this last year, this picture, which you can see on there, was taken October 22nd. I planted this radish the 1st of August. This picture is a good example of, you know, from this October, from this picture here, October of 22, to the previous October of 21, as most of you guys know, this field probably received on average of five inches of rain during that time period, and four of that came in August, right after a, I planted these radishes. And so my point in showing this picture is that, yeah, cover crops take moisture, but even extremely dry year, we were still able to produce, you know, something to keep the ground from blowing away and washing away, even in a very historically dry year. And you see this is that same field. You can kind of see I had corn on the other side of the pivot. This is a pivot, but it received no irrigation to get it up or anything like that. It was failed cotton is why it got radishes, it was failed dry land cotton. But it's the same picture. This was taken January 10th, and all the radishes froze out, and I've got a little bit of rye I need to terminate. And I'll probably go in there and terminate that here probably maybe shortly after this snow kind of dries up because we've got a pretty good cover from the rest of the radishes and should be ready to plant cotton or what in, whatever into here pretty quick. Uh, I wanted to share just a little bit, um, mainly more so my screw-ups on cover crops. I think are probably some of the most valuable things, you know, that it can share with people who are thinking about it or, you know, haven't done it as much. But terminating a cereal too early or too late, you get asked a lot of when should I terminate a cover crop, you know. If you're, you know, like we've all got, you know, you plant plant it behind the cotton stripper and you're going to terminate it and plant some cotton into it again or another cash crop? Well, there's no great answer. Um, I've terminated, terminated a lot of cover crops too early and I've terminated a lot too late um, is really the answer. And so um, my best advice is, I mean, if you knew what the, the weather and the rainfall was going to be, you'd wait and terminate less. I mean, terminate later. If you knew you're going to have a bunch of rain in the spring, you'd like that wheat not to melt down so quick. Um, but if you knew it was going to be dry, and this was the last moisture we're going to get is this snow um, between now and planting, we could probably start thinking about terminating some cereals, you know, earlier. But my best advice is to kind of hedge your bets, you know, because if you can terminate, you know, 
kind of have you a gradient of cover crops. Maybe your better water, you terminate later and take the risk of that cover crop using a little bit more moisture in your, your drier fields, you know, or less irrigation, maybe some dry land, you terminate those earlier um, to have a chance to recharge some of that soil profile. But, and also having a variety of different covers to plant into is the other thing. Because um, depending on how heavy your cover is and how wet it is at planting um, can make a big difference on how early you can get back into the field, what will support a tractor, things like that. Because when you have a heavy cover, um, and especially if it's real heavy, I mean, it'll stay black wet, you know, a month after a rain. It holds a planter and a tractor up better where you're not picking up on the tires and doing that as much because you've got a lot of ground cover, but it's going to stay wetter under there. And so closing a seed trench may be a little bit of an issue. But anyway, I would just say kind of hedging your bets a little bit is what I found kind of works the best. If you do have some heavy cover, I did this one. You're running a stock, cover, stock cutter over some heavy wheat stubble. There's some wheat stubble I let go pretty long because the previous year I terminated too early, so I thought, well, I'm not gonna make that mistake again. I'm gonna let this stuff get big and let it get big about knee high, and I thought, I'll just plant into it. Well, I got to looking at it the closer I got to planting, and I kept thinking, man, I should probably, it's gonna be difficult to get, you know, my planter through knee high wheat stubble. Um, and so I thought, well, I know what I'll do. I'll run my stalk cutter through it. Well, that was the worst thing I could have done. Um, it sure looked nice behind it, and it made nice, a nice trail, you know, on top of the bed where I was going to plant. And I thought, man, that planter will go right through there. It'll be wonderful. All it did was take and, you know, make a thatch out of my straw is all that it did. And I had 14,000 different directions of straw is all I had. Um, instead of just leaving it tied to the ground, where I had all my straw in one direction, if my planter had hit it, I would have been much better off doing that and still have a bunch of it tied to the ground or sticking up in the air. Instead, I broke off all of that vertical biomass and laid it right on the surface of the soil is what I did. Um, and so if you could maybe do it early, you know, real early, but if I did it early, I wouldn't have had as much biomass to work with either. If you can do it early enough and get your biomass stuck to the ground and get a rain, then when your planter gets there, it's not pushing it around, it's not a big problem. But my suggestion is if you have some, some wheat or some stubble or something, is you're better off just leaving it standing. It's a lot easier to plant into than having it all laid as a mat on top of the ground. Um, not letting cover crop go reproductive. This is one that's taken me longer than I'd like to admit to learn this lesson uh, with hay grazer. Um, and specifically hay grazer is what I'm talking about, but really any cover crop, letting go reproductive especially if you're planning on planting into it. I mean, really, it, it takes a solid year to kind of get rid of this, seems like. When those crops go reproductive and produce a seed, they're using a lot of energy and nutrients from the soil that takes a while to get back. And I used to think, well, it'll fall on the ground and whatever it used to go back in and I'll have it there to access from an X crop. Well, it takes longer than what I want it to, is what I quickly figured out, or quickly this year figured out. But especially hay grazer, I had some that it'd come September, I'd plant in the middle of the summer and plant some hay grazer. And I'd be too cheap and too lazy to terminate it in about September when it needed it. That's what I should have done August or September. Um, last year especially taught me this lesson, or two years ago, because we had some good in-season moisture. And so all my hay grazer grew and did well. Half the time a hay grazer burns up and it don't produce any seed. But Two years ago, had enough moisture to grow, and all of it had the potential to produce seed. And I should have sprayed a bunch of it before it went reproductive. And I thought, well, I'm just going to let a freeze get it. Here we are, middle to end of September, close to October. I'll let the freeze get it. I'm thinking how smart I am. I saved that Roundup spraying. That's what I did, right? Well, all that stuff went to seed. The big obvious problem is then I got to spray an extra two to three times the next year killing volunteer hay grazer in my cotton crop. And so I saved a big one spraying in the fall and got to add three in the summer is what I did. Um, then the next thing on top of that, hay grazer especially, or I think most crops when they go to seed are not a great cover. If you've got wheat that you're gonna harvest and let it set out, that's a different deal than letting hay grazer go and then planting into it. Hay grazer, I think has its place and can do really well, especially in a grazing program. Or if you've got cows or you're trying to build biomass really quickly. Um, but then be planning on terminating that before 
you know, it starts growing reproductive. You know, get the biomass when it's pretty tender um, and terminate it before then. Because the other thing you get to contend with once it goes, you know, once it joints and goes reproductive is now you've got bamboo-like sticks in your field, you know, that are, can be three to four foot long that you can deal with in a planter or a harvester um, is the other thing. And so I would caution you, hay grazers are good cover, but just be prepared to manage it and manage it earlier than later is what I would say. And don't be afraid to spend the money to terminate it even before a freeze. Um, I had a good example. I couldn't find a picture of it, but it was on a dryland corner where we planted hay grazer, and we were rolling it down with a stalk cutter. So once again, it's too cheap to spray it, uh, but we we're just laying it down with a stalk cutter. Well, it got wet, and my guy who was on the tractor um, quit about halfway through, or we maybe went to lunch, and then it rained afterwards. Anyway, we ended up with a corner or half of it was rolled down, half of, or half of it wasn't. So basically half the hay grazer was terminated, half wasn't. And this last year we had some dryland cotton on it and even the best dryland cotton wasn't great. But there was still the, the hay grazer that went to seed and went reproductive and was big, didn't hardly make any cotton. You know, the stuff that was terminated early made 200, 300 pounds, you know, wasn't fantastic. But the stuff that where the hay grazer got big and had more biomass and you would think might shade the ground better for the dry land um, was practically non-existent as far as the cotton crop goes. And so it was a very good visual representation of letting this cover go too long. And that was even the cover from the previous summer. So it had all winter long, you know, to recover and you'd think break down and do all this, but that effect was still there even for the next cropping year. Um, getting started on some of this. I mean, if anybody is looking to, or, you know, the, the easiest way to get started is you're really not messing with radishes or hay grazer during the summer and laying some of this stuff. The easiest way to do this is just plant behind some wheat stubble, you know, is the easiest way to get going. And especially, you know, we're looking at having some snow now. There's probably as much wheat planted around as anywhere. You know, a 15 to 20 bushel wheat crop um, is looking a lot better than a dryland cotton crop right now. Um, and leaving some wheat stubble um, out there to plant into would be a good way for a guy to get started. Is I have people ask all the time, what's you know, it can seem daunting getting into covers and stuff like this, but just planting behind a combine um, makes it really nice for planting. It's there's not a lot of trash to move or anything like that. Um, just planting into some some standing wheat stubble that you've fallowed for the year. And if I haven't bored y'all to death or scared anybody off, there's the no-till. Um, Symposium the 14th and 15th um, here in Lubbock at the Overton. So there's a lot of guys been doing this longer and better than I have, especially talking about some wide row cotton and some stuff like that, if anybody's interested. And there's going to be, uh, we just found out yesterday, there's going to be 10 CEUs offered at that deal in February. So anyway, and if you guys got any questions, I'll try to answer them. Okay, thank you all. You're listening to live coverage. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. I think what was probably the most striking to me was the 60% reduction in fuel, um, especially as the cost of fuel just seems to continue to rise. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. I think we're a little bit ahead schedule. So um, we're going to have uh, the next speaker get their PowerPoint up and ready. So if you want to take a short break and visit our vendors, we will um, take about a 10-minute break, and we will be back with our next presentation. <laughs> 